morning. Morning. Is this on? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody doing good? Yeah. Good. Good to be in God's house this morning. Amen. Uh, Ryan's on vacation, so I told him I would do the announcements and read verse of scripture. So, uh, I've got plenty of pieces of paper up here to get to it right now. Uh, first off, before I forget, uh, Sunday school in the morning starts at 9 15, and we will have a nursery. After my mental confusion, if I was here earlier, that was it. But anyway, that's one, and uh, a couple other things. Uh, August the 27th at the church, 6 30. I guess that's PM. Well, they'll have a handyman shower for Joel. Senior supper will be changed from Thursday, August 20th, to Wednesday, August 19th, at 5 o'clock here at the church. Uh, there'll be a shower for Joel and Kate today from 3 to 5, and a white bottle ceremony next Sunday during the service. Okay. I think that's all the announcements. children who must not love with words or speech, but with truth and action. And uh, I know uh, love is not easy. I mean, you know, in, in, in Corinthians, when it talks about love, it says what well, love is and what love is not. And uh, to tell you the truth, it's something I can't do. Please stand again and join us for the uh, human response. And just look at our voices, telling our Lord that we how much we thank Him.
back here in Bethel this morning to have your Bibles with you. I invite you to turn with me to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 7, we'll begin our reading in verse 7, verses 7 through 11 of Deuteronomy chapter 7. Uh, just say a word before we pray and then get into the text this morning. Thank you for allowing me to be back. We've already been praying for you as a church as you begin a transition time, as you start uh, getting an interim pastor and looking for a, a permanent pastor and all of you ahead of you for that. We will continue to pray for you. And uh, just know that God will lead you to the man that needs to pull, fill this pulpit. If you just be assured of that, God has a man. So what's God do is find God's will and then find your way and get God's will and your way together. And when you do, you'll find the right person to be your pastor and God will bless you for that. We'll be praying for you during the process. Uh, I know you probably got an interim coming soon. Uh, I'll be back now. I, Lord will be back Sunday after next, I think, uh, to preach again before you get an interim. And so we're looking forward to that. And so you pray for us as we continue to preach in different places. I uh, bring you greetings from Greenville County Sheriff's Office. I'm still there. A uh, little over three years now, full time as a chaplain and a deputy there. And now we've got a Greer boy uh, in the office there at the Sheriff, Hobart Lewis, doing a good job. Pray for him. Uh, a lot of uh, things that's on his plate. He came into office, you know, kind of after a little tough time with the former sheriff we had and the coronavirus hit and all that's involved with that. So you just pray for Sheriff Lewis as he leads us, that uh, God will continue to give him wisdom. He's a good guy, uh, doing a good job. And, uh, uh, you know, we can't say, we can't uh, promote him, but he will be up for election in November, and I hope that you'll go cast your vote or the one I've been talking about. <laughs> uh, he's a good guy. We like to keep him. Uh, he's just getting settled in real good. And uh, so this, this term will be for the four-year term. He will just fill an unexpired term. Uh, I told him had nobody ran against him in the Republican primary. Had they run against him for Republican, it would have been five times we'd have had a vote for him in one year before it was all over. I said, you might set a record on that one. So this will be the fourth time that you'll have to vote uh, for him in one year. And so we hope that uh, you'll get out and vote, and just from the deputy standpoint, we want to keep him. And so if the Lord leads you that way, then we'll be glad to see you both for him. Uh, pray for us. Every time I come, I always talk to you about praying, for, especially for me in a chaplain role, kind of a dual purpose role as a chaplain and a deputy. Never know from week to week where I'm going to be, and God's opened a lot of doors for me to share the gospel, to be there to help people through some difficult times. My primary role is for the deputies and the employees of the sheriff's office, but also the general public when we're on the scenes, crime scenes, suicides, those kind of things. We see a lot of stuff there. Uh, so you pray for me as, uh, as I'm out there every day working with these guys and gals and seeing the things we see. A lot of stuff we see that you wish you couldn't, didn't have to see, and uh, a lot of stress for that. And we, uh, unfortunately, with our sheriff's office, we've got some relief valve. I'm the first line. A relief valve as a chaplain. I have nine volunteer chaplains that help me out. 
And then we have a mental health clinician who is embedded with the sheriff's office now. So we're getting the help perhaps. You pray for these deputies, all of our first responders, firefighters, EMS workers, the things that they see. Uh, I don't remember now if I was here after I had a bad scene last year of one baby shot himself, and that was tough on me. And I ended, I ended up going to the mental health clinician, get some help myself. And so it's a tough thing out there of what your first responders are seeing. So pray for all of us as we do that work. Uh, they pray for this coronavirus who would have thought we'd been where we are at this point. Uh, just a word of that, just pray and pray and pray. Uh, trust God, do everything. I would say, uh, do everything you can. Don't be, don't be ignorant during these times. But also don't be so full of fear that you can't live. I've got this little saying I've been saying wherever I go. That some people are so afraid of dying they stop living. We can't stop living because we're already going to die, right? All these statistics have been thrown at us. Uh, there's only one that I know that's absolutely true. 100 of people in this world are going to die. That's, that's going to happen. It's the point of the other man who wants to die after this is judgment. And so, uh, you know, take care of yourself. I had the virus back in March. I was one of the first ones to get it to the sheriff's office. And, you know, it's so different for everybody. If I said, well, what happened to go for you? And for me, it was one week of being sick like the flu. Basically what it was, fever, cough, fatigue, that kind of stuff. Lost my appetite. I wish I could have hung on to that a little longer. I was losing a little weight, but it came back. Appetite came back, unfortunately. But uh, a lot of people have a tough time with it, there's no doubt. But just don't get caught up in the panic of this thing. Let's keep living and trusting God. We're going to talk about the faithfulness of God this morning. So I just want to be, I want to encourage you today. That's what I'm trying to do, is just encourage you. Uh, we'll talk about that as we dive into the scripture today. So thank you for allowing us to be here. My wife, Reva, has already mentioned that you're with us today. Uh, keep praying for her and her role. You know, she, for 30 years, she was a pastor's wife and uh, was very active in church, supporting the ministry that I had. As a chaplain's wife, she's not as directly involved with the sheriff's office, so she's still, after three years, she's getting involved in my church. We're members of Clearview Baptist now over on State Park Road. And so she's been involved there in helping the ladies' ministries and stuff. So you keep praying for her as well. So let's pray we're going to dive right into the scripture today. Lord, thank you for this day, for your blessings in our life. We give you glory and praise for that. Thank you, Lord, for able to be back here at El Bethel today. And I pray, thank you for this great crowd here today. They've gathered to hear uh, your word and sing the songs of Zion. And now to open the word of God. And I pray that you, as you speak to our hearts today, that you would help us to hear what you say and to do something about what you say. And so God, today I pray first of all that you forgive me of my sin and cleanse my heart. And help me to preach what you put in my heart today. Pray for El Bethel Church as they move through this transitional time, God, that you would Direct them to the right man to be the interim pastor and then the one to be their permanent pastor. God, that you just match that up for them. They'd be drawn to the person that you want to fill this pulpit and the person that needs to come would be drawn to this place. And so God, give them wisdom, give them faith, give them encouragement during these days that you have a plan for this church and that you have some great days ahead for them. And so I pray you bless them. So now, Lord, as we open your word, May the Spirit of God have the freedom in this place to speak to all of us and we respond to what you say. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. If you're able to stand, stand with me in honor to the reading of God's word today. Today I'm preaching on this subject, faithful to the end. Faithful to the end. Deuteronomy 7, verse 7. The Bible says, The Lord did not send his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. Now, of course, Moses here is speaking to the children of Israel. So in the context, he is talking about the nation of Israel, being the fewest of people. So then he says, verse 8, But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God, listen to these phrases, He is God. Can we just stop and say amen? amen? He's God, not us. Every morning you ought to wake up and look in the mirror and say, there is a God in heaven and I'm not Him, right? He is God. You need to know that. He is God, the faithful God. Isn't that great? He is God, the faithful God, who keeps His covenant and His loving kindness to a thousandth generation with those who love Him, 
and keep his commandments. We'll get to that. But repays those who hate him to their faces, to destroy them. He will not delay with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments, which I am commanding you today to do them. Faithful to the end. Thank you. You may be seated. I think everybody in this room would agree with me that we're living in a time of confusion. We're living in a time of fear. We're, we're living in a time of panic. I think instead of pandemic, it should be panic minute, right? We're, 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 we're panicking like I'm 62 years old, and I have never seen so much panic in our land today. We're talking for church. I said if we shut the media down about six months, we probably wouldn't have near as much panic, right? You know, these numbers and all these statistics and you know, all these numbers, by the way, uh, and I'm not believing it. I had the virus. It's real. I know it's real. There's people dying of the virus. Do you know what? There, there's people dying because of drunk drivers out there, and we're not all upset about alcohol, are we? You know, there's people dying from all kinds of stuff, but the problem is it's not reported like this virus is. And so we're, we're panicking because we keep seeing all those big numbers thrown out there every day. I'm not sure all those, as I said before, uh, the only statistic I know for sure is real is that 100% of the people are going to die in this world. And we keep seeing all these numbers, and so it's causing a time of panic in our land. Panic brings confusion, right? Does everybody agree with that? With everybody agree with that? You better agree with what I'm about to say. This is the Bible. God is not the author of confusion. Amen? We know that for sure. So all this confusion is not of God. And so God... God is not the one who is causing the panic and the fear and the confusion in our land. And God wants us to rise above all these things. The psalmist says that the man who follows the Lord will not be, will not be torn apart when bad news comes. Will not fall apart when bad news comes. The, the Bible teaches us that there's a difference being a believer that we are able to know that this is not our home, right? I mean, uh, we're, we're, we've got a home in heaven, those who believe. So we've got the joy of the Lord. That's our strength, what the Bible says. And so we're different. We're, we're created in the image of God. We have the Spirit of God in our lives. If we walk in the Spirit of God, we don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We've got all these promises that he'll never leave us nor forsake us, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. But yet we're, we're walking in this world of fear. And, and unfortunately, the believers are not standing above the crowd with all this confusion. Again, I'm not saying be foolish in our life. This, this idea of people say, well, I'm not going to die. God gets ready for me to die. Well, you go jump out in front of the Greyhound bus, and the day will be the day God's ready for you to die. Amen. You can't do foolish things. You know, this virus, I tell people, you know, don't go leave the door handle with the QT. You know, you don't want to be doing foolish things and, and try to tempt because we're not to tempt the Lord your God, right? What the Bible says. We're to be smart about things, but we're not to be dictated. We're not to let our lives be dictated by what the world thinks. As a matter of fact, what are we to be? We're to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Now, salt, we don't have time to get real deep in that, but salt is an irritant, right? You ever cut yourself and get in the ocean water and that salt, man, it burns. I mean, if you, if you have an open wound and pour salt on that, it irritates it. Do you know what salt will do? It will heal that wound. When I graduated high school, I had a car accident. The day of graduation, cut my head, and we went to Myrtle Beach. And I remember the first day we were down there, a bunch of us went out there and jumped in the ocean. When I came up, man, I was burning like wildfire where that wound was. Do you know, by the end of the week, I noticed that wound was healed up because I stayed in that salt water all the time. And so we are to be the salt of the earth. And, and, and it irritates the open wound of sin out here. And people get irritated when we talk about finding the peace of God that passes all understanding. And they're like, yeah, but we're in a pandemic. And see, God, he knew this pandemic would come when he wrote the Bible, right? And so he said that there's this peace that passes all understanding that you cannot understand, that you can still have this peace in your heart that controls your heart and your mind, that helps you not to get caught up in all this. So how do we, how do we live during this pandemic? How do we live... In a world that is confused and panicked, and how do we as believers, where do we go to? And my answer is, go to the, the Lord God himself. He is faithful, and God will be faithful to us till the end. God has not bailed out on the believers today. You need to know that God is still God. 
He still knows who you are, and he still knows where you are, and he still knows what you need. So we need to just depend on the faithfulness of God. So let's talk about the faithfulness of God today, faithful to the end. There's some reasons we know that God will be faithful to the end. Now here in the book of Deuteronomy, let me just say quickly, the word, the word Deuteronomy really means kind of like the second giving of the law. It's not that Moses has given them the law. Remember, God gave the law in the book of Exodus, but they had some problems, didn't they? Their problem was unbelief. They did not believe God was who he said he was. Now, they, they believed it when they came out of Egypt, right? They're like, hey, we're getting out. We're not going to make bricks anymore, right? They're coming out of Egypt. Now, all that slavery and all that brick making that they were having to do, they're like, yes, we're getting set free. But before they even got to the Red Sea and they see Pharaoh coming, they're doubting God. They said, you brought us out here for him to kill us. And Moses said, no, I didn't. God, did not bring you out here for you to die. You just behold the, the glory of the Lord. And what happened? The Red Sea parted. And they walked across on dry ground. And so then they get out there in the wilderness and they start, I believe they were Baptists because they started moaning and complaining about everything, right? They were good Baptists, you know. That's what Baptists, I think Baptists think spiritual gift is complaining. That's not found in the Bible, by the way. But that's what they did. And so then they start doubting God. They're, they're hungry. They said, God said, well, all you have to do is ask, and I'll send some bread from heaven. They were well, we're thirsty. And there's no problem. I've got water and rocks out here. And so they, they complain. So what happened? Forty years passed, right? And that generation has to die out before they're allowed to go to the promised land. Now they're about ready to go to the promised land. So now Moses is given up really the a reminder of the law, the second reading of the law. And so he's talking to them about now it's time to go in. And he's saying, God had not changed. I want you to hear me, church. God had not changed today. I don't care what's going on in our country. God has not changed. And God, God's not going to change. Uh, see, here's, here's what I'm afraid we're doing when we pray these days. Instead of getting heaven's will done on earth, we're trying to get earth's will done in heaven. We're trying to change God's mind. We, we think if we say enough words, man, you, you, there's some great speakers praying today. Aren't there? I mean, they go through all these flowery prayers. And, man, it's like God's, God's impressed with my speaking abilities. And so I'm going to get through to God, and I'm going to tell God how to handle this thing. You know what? God does not need our advice. He needs our obedience. What's happening is we use our prayer time to advise God, right? God, you just don't know how bad this is. Do you really think God doesn't know how bad it is? Sure he does. You just don't know what I'm going through. Oh, yes, he does. He knows. He doesn't need our advice. He needs our obedience. And so we've got to, we've got to turn this thing back around and quit being like the Israelites that was telling God what he was going to do. They, they knew nothing about what God was wanting to do. God wanted to take them to the Holy Land. You know how long it would have taken them walking as they walked, remember? Two million of them at least. From Egypt to the Holy Land should not have taken them over about 11 days. They, they could have made it in about 11 days, a straight shot through them. But for 40 years they wandered in the wilderness before they go in. Why? Because of their disobedience. But Hebrews says they did not enter their rest because of unbelief. I will tell you something, folks. God may be testing us today. To see how much rest we have. God, God, listen, I am convinced of this. And I tell you, you cannot prove me wrong on this. Until we learn how to deal with what we have, God will never give us anything different than what we have. And we're not dealing with what we have very well today. We're, we're kind of, we're in that pain mode. So the book of Deuteronomy, they, they've been through some, they, they've been through a pandemic. I mean, they had snakes biting them out there, amen. Right? I was in the woods the other morning. We had a young boy, he, you know, young guy, he cut his ankle monitor off and, and stole a vehicle. And the ankle monitor was peeing over there. So we get over there and realize he cut it off, threw it in the woods. We're out there in the woods trying to find that thing. And there was a copperhead about that big. I told the probation guy, I said, you can find that ankle on your own. I'm out of here. I am not going to have anything to do with it. He's like, I'm out of here too. I heard him call. Where he got said, somebody with a pistol, get up here. And I thought he found a little boy in the woods. You know, I'm running up there. I get up there, I got my hand with my gun. And he's like, there's a cover head. I said, I'm out of here. I ain't shooting now. I'm getting out of here. 
They had snakes out of there. They finally had to make a brazen serpent put it on a pole, didn't they? God said, you, you, you won't grumble against me. I'll send some snakes to destroy. Remember one time we started talking about Moses. The ground opened up and swallowed it. Anybody feel an earthquake this morning? Uh, over, we live over behind Furman and didn't feel it. Everybody all around. I posted on Facebook. I said, Matthew 24, 7, who's going to church now? <laughs> I said, there'll be various earthquakes right before Jesus comes. I, I guarantee you people got up and went to church and wasn't planning on going to church this morning. They felt that earthquake it's up in Sparta, North Carolina. We have that earthquake so. See, God has to get our attention sometimes. And so now Moses saying to the children of Israel, God is faithful to the end, whether you believe it or not. And that's the message from this passage today. You Listen, I, I've never told you this before. There was a bumper sticker that I used to like, and finally one day God said, that thing's not right. And the bumper sticker says this. You may say it. It says, God's word says it, I believe it, and that says it. Now, when you first think that, you think, that's good. I used to think I like that. But God finally spoke to my heart and said this. God's word says it, and that settles it whether you believe it or not. See, God, our belief in the word of God does not settle whether it's true or not. It's true whether you believe it or not. And I'm just telling you that God has an answer for us going through this pandemic that we can be encouraged if we'll just listen to him. So let me get in. I'm, I'm taking too long already to introduce this. Reasons that God is faithful to the end, and really reasons why we should be faithful to the end as well. The first one is simply this God is not faithful because of who you are. God's faithfulness is not based on who you are. Look at verse 7 again. Moses says to Israel, The Lord did not send his love on you, nor choose you, because you are more in number than any of the people, for you are the fewest of all people. So what Moses said to them, God didn't choose you because you impressed God. Did, did you know that, that you be at your best and, and that does not impress God? Let me just tell you what the Bible says. There is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See what you need to do. I, I, I like to look in the mirror because I, I talk to myself. Anybody willing to admit in public you talk to yourself? I, I do. You know, they say you're all right and you don't start answering yourself. But I answer myself too. You know? I'll say self, self say huh. And I'll start talking to myself. I look in the mirror. A lot of times in the morning I look in that mirror and I, and I will say, there's God in heaven and I'm not him. And sometimes I just need to look in the mirror and say, you know what? I'm not as, I'm not the, as hot as stuff as I think I am. And if you're not convinced that, jump up and down and watch all the jingle going on. You just realize it now. I mean, we, we, we need to just take a good hard look at ourselves sometime and say, you know what? You know, it, I don't really impress God with who I am. God's not, but God didn't look down from heaven and say, man, I am so impressed, I'm going to save you. He did not look at Israel. He did not choose Israel because they were the greatest nation on earth. The Bible says they were the fewest people of earth. And so Moses is saying to them, don't, you've already got copy. Now, now the Bible teaches us we're to be confident, right? But confidence is not cockiness. It's, it's confidence. There's a difference in being cocky about who you are and being confident about who you are. We are who we are by the grace of God, right? That's what Paul said. I am who I am by the grace of God. Do you know it's just only by the grace of God that you're not in some third world country this morning being persecuted for your faith? It's just by the grace of God that you're not in ICU this morning. It's just by the grace of God that you're not living, uh, wondering where your next meal is going to come from. Uh, we work in Nicaragua, and we're trying to build some houses right now. No teams can travel, so we're raising money uh, to send down there for the staff to be building homes and feed people. It's only by the grace of God that all of us are not located in one of those barrios in Nicaragua where there is no running water, where there is no electricity, and you live in a cardboard house, and during the rainy season, the water washes through and knocks your walls down. Only by the grace of God that we are who we are and that we have what we have. So God was not impressed with you when he saved you. He, he, his faithfulness is not based on who you are, but secondly, it's based on who he is. 
And there's reasons that he faithful is because not because he was impressed with us. His faith was not because of who we are, but secondly, it's because of who he is. Look at verse 8. But because the Lord loved you. <laughs> you know why God is faithful in? Not because he's impressed with you, but he made a decision that he's going to love you. That he would love his creation. Now, I don't know if you've heard Greek before. I'm not a, I'm not a big Greek scholar. I know a little Greek. He runs Pete's down there on Poinsett, you know. And, uh, but I, I'm not a Greek scholar. But I read behind those who are. You've probably heard the word agape, love. That's the Greek word for, for love. That's the highest level of love. That's the love that God has for us. Agape love is a love that is given for the benefit of the person being loved. Does that make sense? It, it, there's no, it's not the benefit of the person loving it's the benefit of the person being loved that's the greatest part of that love. That doesn't mean that the person loving doesn't get a benefit. Does God get benefit back when we worship Him? Sure. Does God get benefit back when we obey Him? Sure. I mean, it pleases God. Uh, the Bible says, without faith it's impossible to please Him, right? So the opposite of that is, with faith, it is possible to please Him. So what the benefit God gets back when we obey Him and we receive Him and we worship him and we serve him and obey him, then it pleases him. But the greatest benefit of a God play love is that person who's been loved. And really, that's what we need to love one another with. The Bible says that God loved us, we're to love one another. But well, we like to go, we like to drop it down a level to phileo love. Phileo is another word for love in the Greek language, which means brotherly love. You know, the city of Philadelphia, that's what that word means. The city of brotherly love. Delphi means city of. Phile is a, a derivative of the Greek word phileo. So the Philadelphia is a city of brotherly love. We like to say, well, that's kind of love I like to do because then, then I get as much benefit as, as my brother does out of it. And unfortunately, people are getting married with phileo love instead of agape love. See, a marriage only works when you are loving the person for their benefit, not your own. You'll receive back some benefit from that, but you should be loving your spouse for their benefit instead of your own benefit, and your marriage will be a great So anyway, that's the love he's talking about. He said, the reason God is faithful is he made a decision. Listen, love is not an emotion. If you fall in love, you will fall out of love. But if you decide to love and make a decision that changes your life and the life of the person who has been loved, you won't fall out of love. Because you make a conscious decision, that's going to be your life. And God made a conscious decision that he was going to love you just like you are. Isn't that great? I mean, I'm so glad that I didn't have to meet a certain standard before God saved me. God loved me just as I was. Now, now, let me say the other danger side of that. People say, don't worry about it. God loves you just like you are. And he does. But when he saves you, he loves you too much to leave you that way. That's where this book comes in. That's when the word of God has to start working in your heart and your life and change you and make you more like him. I think most everybody knows Romans 8, 28. And we know that, that all things work together for those for good for those that love God and those who are called according to his purpose. We know that verse, but Romans 8, 29 says, And we were predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's what, I, you want to talk about predestination? That's what we're predestined to do, is to become more like Jesus. And so we do that through love. So God loves us just like we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. So we've got to grow, as the Bible will say, we've got to grow in the faith and knowledge, the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we do that, then we are, we are fulfilling that great love that he gave to us. God does not love us because of who we are, but he loves us and is faithful to us because of who he is. Look at it again. Verse 8, but because the Lord loved you, and kept the oath. God's not a liar. What God says he will do, he will do. When God says, if you do this, I will do that. If you do this, he will do that. Now, unfortunately, we're not like that. And, and sometimes, just admit it, even with our best intentions, do we not let our mouth overload us sometimes? I had a good friend he didn't know how to say no. And one time I was standing there, and 
he was supposed to help me do something on Monday. I don't remember Monday morning. Let's say Monday morning. And he'd already said, yeah, I'll be there. I'll, I'll do that. And I'm standing there, and somebody says, hey, Henry, can, can you do this? He said, yeah. So when you do it? He said, tomorrow morning, 830. I said, hold up, Henry. You done told me that you'd be with me at 830. Tell me I'll do something. <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. And I said, Henry, you're going to have you're going to have to quit letting your mouth overload your life. And this is what he said to him. He said, Preacher Ben, one of the hardest things I've dealt with is learn how to quit lying. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You're lying when you don't keep your oath. Don't, don't say, in uh, Ecclesiastes, I believe it is, he said, don't let your mouth cause you to sin. And so we've got to learn that when God says, whatever he says, you can trust that. He's not like us. He, he is infallible, not fallible. And so we got to know that whatever God's word says, if, let me put it this way. If you read the scriptures and you say it doesn't work, it's because you've done it wrong. Amen? Not because God's done it wrong, because all his promises, the Bible says, are yes. There's never a promise in God's word that he will not fulfill if you do what he says you need to do. And so he says he keeps his covenant and he keeps it, uh, verse 8, he keeps the oath which he swore to your forefathers to bring you out by a mighty hand to live you from Pharaoh. The promise was way before they ever got to Egypt, the promise was he would bring them out of Egypt. So now Moses is saying to them, God is faithful to you to the end, not because of who you are, but because he, who he is, and he loves you with an agape love, and he will always keep his word, and he is delivering you, and has been trying to deliver you for 40 years. Yet you would not listen to him, you would not do what he said to do, and so now you've extended the, the promise being fulfilled for 40 years. I want to just ask you a question right here, El Bethel. Ask our nation a question right here. How long are we going to stay in this mess before he'll fulfill a promise to deliver us? How much are we going to disobey him? How much will we not trust him? How much will we rather listen to the, to the word of man over the word of God? Right now, I, I've been praying, as a matter of fact, Right now, we just need, matter of fact, let's just pray right now for the church in code. It's what? Almost 8 o'clock in California. There may be pastors today who are arrested for having church in California in our nation. Nevada, there'll be pastors who may be arrested today because they decided to have church. You see, and I'll, if you haven't read that, you need to know that in America today, because of this virus, they are dictating that churches out there cannot meet in person. Look, can we just pause and pray for them real quick? Lord Jesus, you just reminded me of what some churches on the West Coast are going to be going through today. Because they're listening to the word of God over the word of man. God, I pray for boldness in their life. And I pray, being a law enforcement officer myself, I pray for those law enforcement people that would have to show up. God, I just pray that they just refuse to lock these people up for worshiping you. So give them boldness. Give them strength. For whoever is in the leadership who is dictating that they be arrested, God, I pray you turn their hearts. I pray for the people of God there in California, Nevada, and maybe some other places in our country that I don't know about today who will be facing this right now. So God, give them boldness. Give them encouragement. Give them strength. We pray together and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask you a question that comes to South Carolina. You say, well, it won't happen, and, and I hope it won't. Uh, Sheriff Lewis made it very clear that nobody will be arrested for not wearing a mask or going to church. Or, he's very pro-church. <laughs> that they'll never be able to bring, is it where it's going? Bring candy, is it bring candy? It is, right? I, I, I lose that line over here. You have to kind of wiggle around green. There'll be no church in Greenville County as long as Sheriff Hobart Lewis is sheriff that will be uh, have law enforcement show up and shut them down. It's not going to happen. It doesn't matter what the governor says. It doesn't matter who, what the judge says. He made that clear that that's not going to happen in Greenville County. So we, we praise the Lord for that. But what if it did? What would you do? Come to the door right now and say, if you don't leave right now, you're going to jail. See, we're, we're facing these days where we have, let me put it this way. You have to prepare for the storm before the storm comes. 
If you have already made these decisions in your life, that I am going to trust God and I will obey Him. Like the disciples, I'm, in my devotional time, I do a Facebook devotional every morning. And then we're in the book of Acts, and we're, we're dealing with that book of Acts. You see that, where, where they said, you're going to stop preaching. And they, and they said, no, we're not. And, and finally they say to the Sanhedrin, uh, we, we must obey God rather than man. So have you made that decision in your life? That God is the ultimate one you answer to. Now, as long as, as it doesn't disturb the word of God, we are to obey those in authority over us, right? Romans 13. The authority is for those who are weak and not for those who are good. We do what we pray for and we obey the authority over us. But if we're ever caught in a place where we have to either serve God or serve man, we have to be ready to say, I'm going to serve God. Why? Because God will fulfill what he says, but, but we've got to make sure that we understand the steadfastness. And that's my third reason. Let me move to, I want to get to the fourth one and close it out this morning. He's not faithful because of who you are. He is faithful because of who he is. Thirdly, God's faithful to the end because his faithfulness is steadfast. It's steadfast. Look at verse 9. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, he is faithful. Now let me say, there needs to be no further explanation about that phrase. We, we either receive it by faith that he's God. See, you, you have to make a decision in your life. Is there only one God or not? And if there is, you need to say, okay, God, I have determined in my life that you're the only God. I always say that he's the only one that has a capital G in the name of God, right? There's plenty of little g-gods out here because people are worshiping them all the time. But you need to determine in your life that there's only one capital G-God and he is it. That's the God of creation, the God of hell, Jesus Christ. He is the one and only living God. And you need to decide that. And then secondly, you need to decide, I'm, I'm never going to waver from the fact that God is faithful. Now, how can you do that? Because Not because of who you are again and not what you believe, but because of who he is. Our belief is not based on what we think God ought to be. It has to be based on who he is. And he is the faithful God. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. And so he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You've got to settle that in your heart that God's faithfulness is steadfast. That whatever is going on in your life that, that directs you to think God is not being faithful to you is not true. Let me put it this way. You cannot look at this world and judge the fairness of God. I hear people do that all the time. Well, I don't know why God is doing this today. I don't know why God bless my neighbor who's a heathen got a Mercedes, and my car, I can't even keep it running. Well, let me just tell you why. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. And the Bible says, let me take it one step further, but the Romans, the Bible says that the goodness of God brings people to repentance. You know why your neighbor, your heathen neighbor, may be having more than you? Because God's trying to show him how good he is to bring him to repentance. See, we, we look at this world and we say, now wait a minute, we, we won't ever verbalize it. We're, 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 too, we're too bad at this to verbalize it, you know. We won't ever get out there and say, God's not being fair to me, but we'll mumble it under our breath. You, you, ever, you ever had a kid or you ever do as a kid and mumble under their breath that they're going away? Oh, yeah. I heard a story of a guy going down the road. This was before seatbelt laws, I guess. So the three-year-old was standing up to see. Y'all remember when we stand up to see? Y'all remember? Anybody know what the mama's seatbelt used to look like? There you go. Start slamming on the brake, throw that arm up. You know, daddy used to count to make sure we was all in the back of the bed of the truck by brake check. Boom, boom, boom. Yep, they're all back there. <laughs> so this probably for a seatbelt law. And so this kid stand up, and, he's, and his dad says, sit down. And the kid said, no, I'm not sitting down. Sit down. This goes on about three or four times. You know, this way parents do. I'm going to tell you one more time. And then we tell them three more times, don't we? 
And finally, the dad said, if you don't sit down, I'm going to pull over on the side of the road, and I'm going to, y'all know what tan your hide? That's people that got some people. I'm going to tan your hide. Little boy sits down, that's what he said. I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> Are we not guilty of doing the same thing with God? We'll look at this world, and we'll sit and we'll say, okay, I'll but I'm going to mumble under my breath on the inside. I'm really not doing what I'm doing because I love you, God. I'm doing it because I You know what happened? I don't know if it happened here or not. When our church was shut down clear to you, our altars went off the charts. Uh, I mean, we were, our budget's like $18,000 a week. We were getting $23,000 and $28,000 a week. You know, a pastor said, the reason why I do it, I said, I'll tell you why I do it. People are afraid Jesus is about to come back again. They don't want to be caught not paying their tithes. And, and I think my theory is true because they're coming back down there about, oh, well, it ain't going to help right now, so now I'm start not paying my tithes again. We are so guilty of, of not trusting God and acknowledging Him as the authority in our life. If God, His, His faithfulness is steadfast, which leads me to my fourth and last point. Let's get there. Because y'all are listening way too slow today. I'm not going to win Y'all just listening too slow. So let me move to the fourth point and simply this. His faithfulness is extended to those who are faithful. His faithfulness is extended to those who are faithful. Look what it says in the last part of verse 9. Let's go ahead and start reading the whole verse again. Know therefore the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth generation. Now, if we could stop right there, we could just say, well, hallelujah, I'm acting every how I want to act, and God be faithful to me. But he doesn't stop there, does he? Look, with those who love him and keep his commandments. God, so let's read it together now. Know therefore the Lord your God, he's God. We say, amen. He's a faithful God. Amen. Who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth generation. Amen. With those who love him and keep his commandments. Oh, me. Right? He extends his faithfulness to those who are faithful. Let me put it this way. God is not going to raise spoiled, rotten brats. Anybody know spoiled, rotten brats? I do. Meet them every day. You know, we had, the other day we had a call. A mom called in. Her six-year-old was cussing her and wouldn't do what she told him to do. And she called him daddy. Like, I responded one other day. I uh, mean, the uh, captain and a sergeant. But I, I took the call and so Captain Sergeant said, we had to come see this one. She had two teenagers that were threatening to, to, to hit her, and she was, couldn't do anything with them. We get there, and I'm not lying. The grass was this high outside, and the house looked like a dump. So we go in, and she's like, they won't do anything to do. She was crying. And so I said, uh, ma'am, do they have, uh, I said, I know they're, they're probably too big and whipping. They're probably like that. She was a whipping. I said, do they have cell phones? She said, yeah, both of them are. I said, then take your cell phones away from them. I can't, get them. I can't get them away from them. I said, then call. I said, who got it with Verizon? She said, yeah. I said, call Verizon and have them took them. Turned off. Doesn't have it. It won't work. You like, oh, I haven't thought about that. I said, do you have the internet? Here? And she said, yeah. I said, put a password on there. They don't know how to get to the internet. I guarantee this. I said, why don't you grass this high? They won't cut it. I said, turn their internet off. Take their phones from them. And they'll start cutting grass, doing what they want to do. I said, you buy them new clothes all the time? She said, yeah. I said, quit buying them new clothes. Make them. I said, go and find some at Goodwill that looks awful and say, here's your clothes. Get rid of the rest of them. This is not rocket science. <laughs> but yet what we do, we look at small rotten branches of this world and what do we do? We say, you know what, I can get by with that with God. I just want to, I want all his promises. I want him to be faithful to me, but I'm going to act like I want to act, and I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to talk like I want to talk. No, not going to happen because God says, I'll be faithful to you, but you are required to be faithful to me. You see, you, the peace of God passed all understanding. You know that passage. There are requirements. See, there's some things that what's saying. Be anxious for nothing. In everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, 
Let your request be made known to God. Then the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your heart and mind. So you have to you quit, you have to quit worrying. Can I just tell you, everybody's worried to death these days. God says you'll never have peace as long as you're doing that. Jesus said, who worrying can add one hour to their life? And the answer is nobody. So God says all these requirements, I'm faithful, I'm God, I'm faithful in. I will, I will, my loving kindness and my covenants will be with you then. But you have to love me and keep the commandments. What did Jesus say? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. What did John say? He said, those that love him will keep his commandments, and those commandments are not grievous, they're not burdensome, they're not too hard to keep. See, we go, well, this is just too hard. It's not too hard. If we look at the whole areas of life, like we did our spiritual life, we'd never get anything done. You'd be fired from your job. I mean, tomorrow morning you go into the job and boss comes and says, just like, oh, it's just too hard. I can't do it. He looked at you or she looked at you and said, excuse me? It's just too hard. Huh? It's going to take too much of my time. It's just, I, I'd love to sit right here. I know, I love our company, and I love my paycheck. And try that for a day or two. Just see how good that works out for you. See, these other areas of life, what do we do? We do whatever it takes. I mean, you know why? Well, y'all going to get me off sidetrack here in a minute. <laughs> I'm, I'm about to wrap this up, I promise. You ever notice? If you'll send a sick kid to school, you'll wipe their nose and, and put a band-aid over it where enough help comes out or whatever it takes, get them to school. You know why? Because it's the law that your kids go to school. But they get a little sniffle. Well, we couldn't go to church Sunday because John had a little sniffle. We had to stay up. Can I get a witness? Y'all with me? You know what I'm talking about? We treat the world better than we treat God. And we wonder why we're having to wear masks these days. We wonder why you can't go in a restaurant, you have to in car or something other before they call you. We wonder why we're debating. By the way, this debate about school, and I'm not making light of this at all. We were camping last week up in Sevierville. They got all these big things in the ground and that was like a trampoline, old bouncy thing. There were at least a hundred of them over there falling, licking that thing in their seat. I mean, and I said, if they do that, I believe they'll be all right in school. <laughs> you know? The swimming pool, you could not have taken a stick and stuck it down in there without hitting the kid in the, in the, in the head. I'm like, they're packed in there like cordwood. I'm like, you, you see what we're doing? You know, we're picking and we're choosing. And, and then we're panicking and we're confused. And, we, and then we say, God, why are you doing this to us? I don't. I don't think this is the language of God, but it relates to me. I, I don't point if God looked over and said, duh. <laughs> I mean, I'm faithful, God says. But you're not. And until you become faithful, I'm not going to move you through this stuff. Until you learn to trust me with all your heart, mind, and soul and strength, we're just going to kind of let you flounder around. God will let you stay where you are. Until you get where you need to be to go where you should be. God will let you stay where you are until you get where you need to be so you can go where you should be. I think we're so far behind in being where we should be in America today. We're going to get busy and get caught up. I'm, I'm done with this statement. God is faithful. God will be faithful to them. My question is, will you? That's what we got to answer. Let's pray. Lord, in my own heart and in my own life today, I've just got to confess my sin. And there's so many times, Lord, that, that I get caught up in this stuff. And that, that I may look at this world and judge the fairness of God. Forgive me for that, O oh Lord. And help me to not only be who I need to be so you can be who you want to be in my life. And God, help me to be an example for others and an encouragement to others. That people would see something different in me and as your word says, that they would ask for a reason of the hope that's in me, that I'd be ready to give them an answer. And again, Lord, give us wisdom. We don't want to be foolish. 
We don't want to do things that would bring harm to our life or harm to other people's lives. But God, give us wisdom to know where that line is where those people are facing out west this morning to obey man and obey God. Lord, may we turn back to you and, and show that we love you by keeping your commands. God, help us that day by day we not whine and complain about how hard it may be to do this or that, but that wholeheartedly we can just submit our lives to the Lord our God, the one who is God, the one who is faithful. We will be faithful to thee, and God help us to trust you more today. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed in just a moment. We're going to have a hymn of invitation. And uh, I know we're in this thing of social distancing and all that stuff. And so however comfortable you are with what you need to do, this altar is open, is what I'm saying. You can come stand here and kneel here. Or you can just stand there with your chair or, or kneel at your chair or move to another part of the, the gym here and move to wherever you need to be able to go and do business with God. Would you dare, would you dare today to say to God, okay, God, I, I know you're faithful. And just say that to him. I know you're faithful. And I'm going to determine in my life today that I'm going to be faithful. To you. Whatever I need to start doing that I'm not doing to be faithful or whatever I need to stop doing that I am doing to be faithful, I'm willing to do that. Now, you make that commitment to him. You've got to carry that commitment out of this building and, and into your life tomorrow. So make sure you're serious about doing that before you make it. Maybe you need to be saved. If you've never truly been saved, that's where you got to start. He, he will be faithful to you if you will love him and keep his commandments. So you need Christ in your life today. Now, I'm, I'm just going to stand in. I know you don't have a pastor right now. I'm going to be at the front. If you need somebody to tell you how to be saved, I'll be here for you. Maybe you need somebody to pray with you. I'd be glad to do that. If God directs you during this invitation, you do what he tells you to do. Lord, now during this time, as you speak, help us to respond in a way that will please you is our prayer today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and we just come and we sing God. Just bow your heads, close your eyes right there where you are. She plays one more verse of that song for us. Would you just dare right there where you are, just, just talk to the Lord a minute before we close and just say, Lord, am I faithful or not? Is there areas of my life that I need to deal with here this morning? And if he shows you those areas of your life that you need to do that, then would you just respond to him right there where you stand? But just take just a moment before we close. Amen. Thank you for letting me be here and thank you for being here this morning. I think our brother's going to come and close us this morning.